All right, howdy everybody. Okay. Um very good. Um <laughs> I was working right up until right before I was supposed to get started and and then it was weird because I couldn't find my charger and then this thing was out of battery. So anyway, I feel a little flustered. <laughs> So I hope that's not a sign of how things are going to be today. Um, looking at my hair, it might be, huh? Anyway, uh, while I'm waiting for questions to come in, um, and by the way, feel free to interrupt me. Um, so yeah, we're we're back to publishing videos almost every day now. Um, don't forget, you guys, by the way, my more, like, casual, now all my videos are kind of casual anyway, right? My more casual videos are um, like the behind-the-wheel videos. Those are only available um, on the blog, ltgrado.com, uh, right? ltgrado.com. I'll, I'll type that in here so people can altigrado.com that's the blog okay and so yes so we had we had a hymn we did, I did that scale thing on Saturday I did the hymn on Sunday we did a new uh, improv so we're almost up to a hundred free improvisations on the on the um, free improv series of YouTube. That's very exciting. I would like to after the hundredth after we reach one hundred. I would like to do like duets with people. That's a little frightening because. Usually when people do that free improv stuff, <laughs> it's, it's um, not what I do, I guess is a good way to say that. Uh, and finding people that are willing to do the free improv stuff, but, oh, yeah, it's just, I don't know, finding duets, being able to do duets like that. Now, I did one with my son, and I, I, we will probably do a few more like that with him. Anyway, so that was uh, free improv on Monday. We did another play-along video on Tuesday. Now, that was, I think, a Christmas one. I think Joy to the World or something like that. And then Wednesday is that, I called that one, um, they don't believe me. <laughs> right? So, and then what else? Yesterday, Thursday. So each one of these days is, uh, it has a theme, right? So hymns on Tuesday, free improv on Monday. Now the free improv isn't going to be every week because sometimes I just publish music on, on Monday, right? New songs come out on Monday. Um, Tuesday is the play longs always. Wednesday is always the um, behind the wheel videos. Thursday is always a score video. And on my blog, I just started this week a new series where I look back at some of the cool things I've done in my career. I call my, it's my throwback Thursday um, series. And I started with the Tom Bowling Bebop CD. And the nice thing about that is I put, at the very top of the page, I put a, one of those uh, widgets, whatever you call it, applet, that gives you an opportunity to listen to the music that I'm talking about in the video. And that one in particular, that's jazz, and it's all, all but one of the songs is songs that I wrote when I was actually pretty young, really. Um... And it's some of my best writing, really. The, the, the one song, A Lonely Ending. When I hear A Lonely Ending, 
man, that's a powerful tune, and I, it's almost like I didn't write it because I don't, I don't have any other songs like that, you know. So anyway, yeah, Thursday is the 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 um, score videos. Friday is this, and then I do a feature. I try to do a feature. It's just that the features are so hard to to finish, right? So that's what I was working on right before we started. I have a, a new, I call them features, right? Basically, me talking about trumpet stuff. Uh, tomorrow, I'm talking about lip slurs. So that one will be out tomorrow. I might change the time, right? I've been considering that because I, I was looking at some statistics. And I thought that Saturdays were, were busy YouTube days. It turns out that Saturdays are kind of eh on YouTube. And I've been putting my most important videos, uh, I've been posting them on Saturdays. Well, now that doesn't make any sense. Looking at the chart, it makes more sense to do Friday. So I might, I don't know if, I, if that video is not done yet. So when we're done here, what I might do is finish it up real quick, publish it, put it out today, and see if I get some better response on that than I have been, you know. Hello, Anthony. Anthony says, hello, good, Eddie, good to see you. They canceled my band practice again last week. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. You know, some people get angry when I talk about COVID-19 on these trumpet videos. And here's the problem. And I know I said this last week. You know that that old saying, the elephant in the room, right? At some point, COVID-19 becomes a, a, a relevant issue. <laughs> you know? If we can't, if the reason why we can't do what we do is because of that virus, then it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's fair play. Right? Hello, Raimo. Nice to see you. Yeah, so, you know, and you know what? I don't have anything against people that get upset, right? I'm not, I'm, I'm not anti-people getting upset, okay? It's just that it's almost as if they're the only ones that are allowed to get upset, <laughs> right? If, if you're on that side, you're allowed to be upset. On our side, while we're being crushed under the weight of this, and it's, let's, be, let's be clear about this, it's not the disease that's doing this, it's the government that's doing this, right? We are being crushed by decisions that are being made by the people in the government. So that's what I, if I, if I have anything to say against the people who um, don't like me talking about the virus, the only thing I don't like about that is they're allowed to be angry. I'm allowed to be angry. So, <laughs> you know, that's how I see this. This is not a one-way street. And, uh, you know, I, I, that's how I see this. And, you know, I, I, I guess what it comes down to is a matter of risk. What do they call that? Risk management, right? Hello, Gabriel. It becomes a matter of risk management, and sometimes, see, this I'm not just some idiot that doesn't know anything about music. I mean, about anything but music, right? I'm, that's that's not who I am. I do an awful lot of reading and research and stuff like that, and I know a lot of people, you know could care less about people like me because I I don't have a degree or anything like that. Um, and for that reason, they, they won't listen to what I have to say. 
But sometimes when you look at the risk management mathematically. Oh, you know what? There's another word for that, too. Um, cost analysis, right? That, so risk management and cost analysis. Uh, you know, when this whole COVID-19 first came out, I was asking people and doing research and looking. I wanted to see what's the answer to this one question. Who did the cost analysis for the lockdown itself? Who did the research on finding out what is this going to cost? What is it going to cost in terms of money, but not just money? What is it going to cost in terms of lives lost? How many people are going to be killed by the lockdown? Now, today, we actually know that lockdown kills people. It doesn't kill rich people. It kills poor people. We know that. The WHO actually came out and said so, right? Which is very interesting. Anyway, do you know what? I better stop. <laughs> I could go on. This is going to be a whole hour-long COVID session, you know? Let me just summarize. It's I don't if it's okay for them to be angry that I talk about it. It's equally okay for me to be angry and talk about it. There we go. I'm done with that now. <laughs> Anybody have any trumpet questions? I'm sorry to hear that your band got canceled again, Anthony. Any questions? So this next video is on lip slurs, okay? The next video is on lip slurs. And basically talking about the difference between my lip slurs and other people's lip slurs and how to do them correctly. That comes out either right after this lesson or, I mean, right at a lesson, I'm sorry, right after this Q&A or um, tomorrow morning. I'm probably going to shoot for right after this because it's right now it's bouncing already. So for those of you that don't know this stuff, bouncing is when all the files and everything is set up. You're just now creating a final version that gets uploaded. So that video is done. In fact, I'll show you what that looks like. So there's, the green bar tells you how much is already done. So it's almost finished. So that's the lip slur one. Actually been working on the lip slur one. You know, what a lot of people don't know about creative, being creative, is that it's a numbers game. I think we've just recently passed 900 videos on the channel. 900 videos, right? And no, I'm not doing that because I'm trying to get a lot of videos. Um, I don't even really know why I'm doing that like that. <laughs> you know, the thing is, is people, people like this stuff, right? And it's just that it's not a lot of people. But I don't care about that. I'm, I've never been wanted to be like famous or anything like that. So, um, so like each one of these little areas that I do, like the hymn stuff, people love the hymns. The play-alongs, there's people, someone even on this, on, on the Q&A one day, um, came in just to say thank you for the play-alongs because people are using them. I know they're being used in South Africa. I know they're being used down in South America. I know, you know, I hear people, I hear from people, they, they like the, the play-alongs. Um, there's other people that like the score videos. So each one of these things is something that, that, that people actually use, right? And so it's, it's not my point to go out and, and do, because at this rate, we'll be past a thousand videos 
any sometime soon, right? Um, that's huge. I, <laughs> I anyway, my point is that um. Oh, I can't remember what I was talking about. It's been a weird week. Gabriel says, Eddie, I thank you for everything because you changed my approach to the trumpet. Well, then, thank you, man. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just telling you guys, you know, the, the people like this stuff. And... Um, and I want to make sure that it's it's there for people, right? It's it's not. Um, I don't know. <laughs> but you're right. Well, that's one of the things I talk about in this new video. Gabriel says, "But lip slurs are taxing." You know, um, when you do my lip slurs. You know, I used to do two hours of lip slurs. It's, you know, it started off with me doing the Irons book. I used to do, when I was in college, I used to do the whole Irons book from the beginning to the end. And there, and that, that was just Irons, right? So Irons, if I'm not mistaken, it's been a long time since I've opened the book. Irons is half triple tongue, uh, double tongue, and half lip slurs, if I'm not mistaken. And isn't there another one called by by Bush, Irving Bush, or something like that? Anyway, I used to do all these books. I thought you had to do everything you knew every day. And it was part of that. That was part of the reason why uh, I ended up creating my own method, because that destroyed me. And... So here's the thing, talking about the lip slurs, uh, with the physical trumpet pyramid structure, the traditional lip slurs don't quite help very much. That's why I had to write new lip slurs. Because the traditional lip slurs, you know, you, you even look like look at why people even do those lip slurs. They think they're doing them for strength. I have to say it that way because I don't believe strength is really an issue. Right? Um, anyway, so yeah, that's what I'm talking about in the video. Boy, I'm kind of like halfway not here right now. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Oh, man. It might be the change in the weather. So we had a, a kind of a rainy week this week. And now it's cold for the first 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 cold weather of the year. And every time ever since I moved to Houston, <laughs> every time this part of the year comes and goes, I I hit myself like, oh man, you should have gone flounder fishing. <laughs> Eddie, once you talk about a book that made you understand what was the concept of resistance. Yes, sir. That's the Bob Finley book. Bob, it's called Bob Finley on Trumpet. My understanding is today, it's kind of hard to find. Let me look real quick. See, it's very strange when someone has, when someone fam famous like that has a book, and then you do a, okay, so there's a Google Books entry for it. It's called Bob Finley on Trumpet, but I think this is a rare book, even if you go to, to eBay or something. I think it's difficult to find it. I'm, I'm going to search eBay real quick. Yeah, it comes up with a mouthpiece. No matches. So nobody on, not even anyone on 
eBay is selling this book. So you're asking, is it like, Gabriel says, is it like one range? Not really. I think it's more concept than anything else. Well, he does have exercises at the end. I never used any of the exercises. Mainly because I already had my own. I think if I had not already been established what I was doing already, I probably would have done his exercises. You know, he was a student of um, Callet. Not Callet. What am I saying? Um, Caruso. He was a student of Caruso. And so his exercises in the book are very Caruso-like. But it's mostly about, well, I'll show you guys real quick. I have it. I think. You know what? These are the books I will never lend out to anybody because I have a bad track record with people not bringing my stuff back. And normally I'm real organized. For some reason, I don't see it here. I, in the, I gotta tell you guys about this. In the 90s, I thought, you know what? I really should have every major trumpet book out there. I should have all of them. It's not good enough to to just have your head in the sand, as a, especially as a teacher, right? As a teacher, you want to really, really have a concept of what, of all the different options, right? Well, I don't see it. That's really disappointing. Got a lot of other great books in here. And it's surprising how many of these are just not available anymore. Like this one. Look at that book. Pedal Tone, Pedal Note Studies for Trumpet. That's an awesome, awesome, awesome book. Huh? Anyway, I don't see it. I apologize. I hope I didn't lend that to somebody. Um... What did it change in your technique? Okay, so let me tell you my my Bob Finley story. Um, I had books, and somebody else had wanted to try my books. Uh, someone I knew online, someone that was on the same trumpet community as I was. This was back in the 90s. And he said, how about, because he knew I was, I'm assuming he knew, and I, I don't remember who this was, but I'm assuming he knew that because I made it clear I was trying to get every book that I could get, right? And so he had books I wanted. They weren't books he wrote. Um, now, I had uh, traded my books for another guy's books like that before, that uh, Robert Wiest those are some great books too. And I traded my books. So he got mine. I got his. That was wonderful. Right. So anyway, this guy sent me two books. It was one was by Marsikowicz. I think Marsik. Let me see. Oh, I have that one here. I just saw it right now. Yeah, Marsik. Wait, wait. Yeah, Marsikowicz. Right. See that? So he had this book. And he had the Bob Finley book. So he said, if I send him my books would, in exchange for these books, would, would I be okay with that? I told him yes. The books showed up. I had a gig Friday night. The books showed up while I was at the gig. Then I had a gig at noon the following day, Saturday, the next day. I read the whole book that night when I went to bed. And reading his 
description of how resistance worked. I had already been using all of the resistance except one thing, right? Um, he talks about using the jaw as a, a, a um, form of resistance. And I was always taught, and I always played this way, that the jaw should be so far down in your mouth, more as as far down in your as possible, right? Well, you know, always playing like this, right? And I could play up up past super C that like that, except it sounded really really thin and weak. But I could play the notes, and I had a lot of trouble with accuracy up there. And, and from high C and up, I had a lot of trouble with accuracy. Um, now, I always have trouble with accuracy. That's been my whole life, and I'm, I really believe it's these teeth. Um, but it was a lot worse back then. Anyway, so I read the book, and so understanding, because of reading his book, that the jaw is actually part of that, Resistance. I went to the next gig, easing off on this, keeping the jaw open all the time. And I actually sounded tremendously better on that next gig. It was like flipping a switch. And so I'm not going to say, and I've said this before, I'm not going to say that that everyone who reads this book is going to have that same experience. For me, it was very something very specific that I was doing that was causing too little resistance. And when I understood that was happening, I could move my jaw into the position I needed. And all of a sudden, my playing did get better. And it was something that was uh, switched on. I didn't have days where it got worse and days when it was better. No, it was instantly good. And, you know, later I, I was able to email him and I thanked him for that book. For Not, not the guy that, that sent it to me. I actually got in touch with Bob Finley. Sent him an email and told him how wonderful the book was. And then he said in his response that Carmine Crusoe would be very happy to hear that. So, yeah, so it really is a Caruso method thing. But yeah, you know, that's part of the reason why I have this philosophy now about, about bad teaching. Or... It's possible also that it's not the teacher. Sometimes the students can get like cross-wired because of the, the way they understand it. So yes, Gabriel, the, the, the jaw position wants to be low, open for low notes and, and more closed for higher notes. So you actually, as you go up, bite down on the note. You can even see when I do um, an octave jump that the jaw is going up and down. Right? Um, now, here's the thing. Mathematically, this is... Uh, Golden ratio stuff, right? We've talked about that before. This is golden ratio stuff. And the higher you go up, the smaller the changes are. So when you go higher, the so like for here, C to C, there is some very um, noticeable differences in that position. If you go to the other... And the movement is less, right? And each time you go higher, the, the movement is less. 
And I think that's what he says in the book. I, you know, I remember years ago, my wife, you know, sometimes she'd sit in the living room while I'm teaching. And I remember years ago, my wife said to me that I needed to stop giving credit to all the people that contributed to what it is that I know. So, yes, Gabriel, this is the same as for the tongue. So, Lucas, hello. So what do you mean, what is this exactly? So, yeah, my wife told me that I needed to stop telling my students where everything comes from, right? Um, sorry about that, guys. Let me get rid of this. We don't get very many of those, right? You would have, you know, I would have thought that a lot more of that stuff would happen. I apologize for that. Not much I can do about it besides block them when it happens. Okay. If, if, that, if those messages are still there, let me know so that I can um, do something about that. Anyway, so yes, my wife told me that I needed to stop crediting all the people that where I got my information from because it was making me sound apologetic, right? And, and the truth is, the truth is that um, uh, as you get, as you collect more and more of these sources and, and inspirations and all this stuff, it really does start to just um, snowball. I guess that's a great way to put it. it. All that information starts to snowball and it no longer becomes, in this case, for example, Bob Finley's information. It no longer becomes my trumpet teacher from college's information. It no longer becomes, you know what I mean? At, at, at some point, you have to take ownership of this information. And it should be the same way with you guys. Um, at one point, it's no longer Eddie Lewis's idea. It's your idea now because you've taken ownership of it and it and and done things with it that are fall outside of the scope of what I teach. That's how I see it. And my wife was absolutely correct. You know, she, I don't know how much I've mentioned my wife um, before we got married, she was a physicist, <laughs> right? She taught physics at the university and did some, like, nuclear reactor research and stuff like that. And so she's got lots of experience teaching. She taught 18 years at university. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Gabriel. Gabriel says, for me, it will be an information from my master, Eddie Lewis, <laughs> and not from the author of the book. Right. So, um, yeah, anyway, so she, she told me that when I tried to give all the sources, and you know what? I told her, I said, the reason I was doing that because, was because I didn't think that people would take what I was saying seriously if it was coming from me. Does that make sense? So I would say, I learned this from so-and-so. And I would say it that way because I would want them to have the same respect for that information that I do. And you know what was ironic about that is when I stopped trying to tell people where I got all that information, that's when people started respecting the information. So I think it really has something to do with what we call taking ownership, right? You take ownership of what you what you teach, what you learn. 
So, um, anyway, any other questions? My brain is in big, a little bit of a fog today. So, <laughs> any other questions? I have to get my hair cut today. <laughs> and I trimmed my beard yesterday, and I'm like, oh, I accidentally hacked off too much of it. And now there's nothing there anymore. Hello, Mr. Walker. Any Christmas music videos coming out? Um, not yet. The, the Christmas thing I was working on is taking me too long. I'm, I'm concerned it won't be done for Christmas. <laughs> so I'm working on a, a trumpet trio for Little Town of Bethlehem. Yeah. Yeah, that one. So I hope I can finish that before it's too late. I'm just having trouble with, okay, part of the trouble is I'm, I'm limiting the range so that it, I'm trying to make it, because when I look at the distribution of my, my music, right, I've got skill levels that I've got too much music and skill levels of not enough music. And I'm trying to even those, those out so I'm trying to write this one in that range between low F sharp and G above the staff. And there were several great ideas I had that went out of that range. And I said, no, I don't need any more of those pieces. <laughs> right? So that's part of the problem with this one. Um, oh, and another part of the problem, it's not really a problem. So I'm digging into this Christmas carol, right? And I realize that this is one of the most beautiful hymns that I ever worked on in my whole life. Oh, Little Town of Bethlehem is one of the most beautiful, in terms of the writing, I'm talking about the, the part writing, the, the, what we, in, in, in music theory, we call it part writing with the, the, the choir parts, right? That's some of the most beautiful, most mature, uh, wonderful, wonderful writing. And it's so beautiful. I'm having trouble being creative with it because I don't want to. It's like if, if it starts off that wonderful, I don't want to do anything that takes it down another level, right? I want something that, that might, you know, you know, I, I, I don't complain a lot. Um, and, and so don't take this as a complaint. When I look at stuff, I look at whether I would like to do that or whether I don't want to do that, right? So when I hear people who, when they write music like that, they get rid of the harmonies that came with the song. Now, sometimes the harmonies aren't so good anyway, so that's okay, right? But in a piece like that, where the harmonies are so gorgeous, if someone like does what I call um, pan diatonicism, and the reason I say I call, you know, I know that's supposed to be like um, you shouldn't say what, what I call when someone else already uses that term, <laughs> right? People, I've seen comedy skits about that. Um, but I have to say it in this context because I don't think I'm using the word the same way as other people, okay? So pan-diatonicism is when you have more, like, it sounds like, without getting into the details, it's more wishy-washy harmonies right? It's basically the kind of harmonies my beginner composition students write. 
And to take a beautiful hymn like that and, and make it go backwards. Yeah, so so anyway, that's what's holding me up on this, is I want to do a great job on this because it's such a beautiful, beautiful piece. I hope that makes sense. Radio, uh, Radio Free Santa Barbara. Howdy, Radio Free. <laughs> Discovered your books through your videos. Thank you. I'm glad. I experienced an in Immediate improvement in my playing. Great, we like that. And after years I am of playing, I finally feel I am becoming proficient on the instrument. <laughs> right? We love that. We love that. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, we like hearing about that stuff. Papa Walker says, I like the limited range. Yeah, you know what? That's part of how I how I write. You know, I try to I try to have an idea of the parameters before I before I start. Um, Gabriel says <laughs> Gabriel says, when is the new book about undressing the music will be out? <laughs> I love that. And then he corrects himself and puts understanding. So um, I just need to get on it. I'm sorry, Gabriel. It's a great book. It's finished. I don't know if I told you why I need to put more time into it. Um, it was originally going to be for younger students, and I gave it a nautical theme. So each of the steps has nautical um, nautical, what do you call it, uh, sort of events, right? So instead of working, oh, and that's where I got the idea for it because um, the guy that invented working backwards didn't call it working backwards. He called it working crab-wise. And that's what got me moving in the direction of, of associating it with the, the sea. So each of the steps... Um, like tacking. I don't know if you guys know what tacking is. Tacking is when you, like if you want to sail into the wind, you do this like left, right thing. So, um, so yeah. So that's what I need to do now. I actually have to go through all the book and kind of sort of surgically remove all of those nautical themes. And that's not going to be easy. And I guess the reason I haven't done it yet is because I don't feel like doing that. That's that's like office work, you know. I guess I should. It's a book that's that you know. It's the book. That book is a lot like the One Range book. So. Um, because it's got no no music written in it. It's not exercises. It's just another strategy book, right? So I know for sure it won't be done this year. So I, I'm thinking a few months at least. I'll, I can tell you this, Gabriel. You asking about it uh, helps me get uh, motivated to uh, get that book done. I think it's going to be an awesome and very powerful book. I really do. All right. <laughs> you guys are funny. Um, Anthony says, I purchased a Zoom 1HM recorder, a 1HN, to use with my trumpet practice. Anyone here own one? I wish I did. I have a student that has one, and we he actually... So he's a, he's a Skype student in T Tucson, and he actually when we're when we're doing the lesson for a long time, what I was hearing was coming through his Zoom. I think he's on an, uh, something more advanced than that now. So I wish I could. 
Zoom is a, a handheld, like a almost a pocket recorder, digital recorder. It's, most of the ones I've seen have two microphones on them facing like this. They have excellent quality. Very, very good quality recording on those things. I think it's they're like two hundred and sixty dollars or something like that. I looked into one because I thought if my if my um student was using that, I better like up my game, but then I never followed through on it. Something I'm considering getting before the end of the year is a real video camera, like what they used for like, um, you know, like a JVC or something, like a real, like what they used for the TV or whatever, um, like entry level, one of those. Really, really considering it now. And I would find out how to do that with these. I think, I think it's possible to do the streaming without using my, my webcam up here and use that and use the, the recording stuff they have on that, I think maybe in the future we might go that direction because it's a better video, better, um, better sound, stuff like that. That's a great deal for a hundred bucks, Anthony. That's a great deal. All right, any other questions? So I have a gig tomorrow. I'm going to tell you about this. There's a band that I played with in the 90s, started playing with. It was called Cadillac Black Brass. It, we only ever did school concerts. And uh, somewhere along the way, the leader couldn't do these concerts anymore because he started teaching at a private school. And so he gave the band to one of the earliest other members. Uh, and that, that leader um, changed the name of the band to Blue News. And... As of about two months ago, the, that Blue News leader, so we're talking like 25 years that I've been in this band, um, he decides he wants to live in the country, and he's only coming back to Houston uh, on the weekends for gigs. And since, he, since most of our gigs are during school, that means he won't be available for most of the jobs. So he gave me the band. <laughs> I'm now the leader of the Blue News. And our first gig with me as leader is tomorrow. Uh, we have a park con park concert um, at Levy Park, Le Levi Park, Levy Park. I think it's Levy Park. I think that's how you pronounce it. So we have a concert tomorrow playing holiday music with a jazz group at the park at one o'clock. Uh, Anthony, if you're in around, it's like in the, kind of like in the Galleria area. So if you want to come check it out, we're at one o'clock at, at Levy Park. So, Gabriel says, Eddie, is the flugelhorn used in classical? Yes, it is. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for flugelhorn in classical music, and I might be mistaken, I think some people do the post horn solo for Mahler, I want to say Mahler 3, Mahler Symphony Number no. 3, I think some people do that on flugelhorn. But yes, there is some flugelhorn work in the, in the classical symphony stuff. And a lot more flugelhorn in the, the concert band stuff. 
Mr. Walker says, so when you make the recordings, you just play straight into your computer camera and mic. Um, uh, if you're asking me, no, I actually have a, a setup right now. Let me show you that. So now I have more than one computer. So on this computer, I have my... Let's see if you can see that. So this is my M box, which is connected to that computer. Okay. And that software is open for that. That's when I, that's what I record into that software. Okay. And so there's the microphone that feeds into the M box. And then my camera, which is not where it normally is. Um then, so you'll notice, you'll notice that the camera is not hooked up to the inbox, okay? Which creates a little bit of extra work for me because I have to, after I'm finished with the recording, I have to take that sound and merge it with the video because the video on the actual camera there is awful. <laughs> it's bad, right? And I can't do multi-parts with the camera anyway. So I go to the other computer, and I, I edit the video, splice the, the, the more professional sound onto the video. I hope that makes sense. So no, it's not... I don't have... That I don't believe that there's any high quality, like professional quality solution for um, just plugging into the computer and doing it that way. That's why people buy these um, digital interfaces. Anthony says, still working on playing faster. Need to play something a quarter note at 180 and three four time. I'm about 150 now. Oh, that's great. Are you using the metronome for that? Gabriel says, do I record the gig tomorrow? Actually, they don't allow that on a gig like that. So sometimes um, the contracts will say that there's absolutely no recording allowed. So, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's one of those gigs. And it's because our, our concerts are normally associated with children. We're usually teaching at the schools. Okay, so yeah, they don't allow that kind of stuff. There's a lot, then there's different reasons why they don't want. You know, I got a, I got a check in the mail. <laughs> and, um... Some people were confused. I was watching the conversation in the email. Apparently, what happened was is a, a orchestra I played with. They call it, um, they call it, um, what do you call it? Uh, the Latin Philharmonic. And apparently, they took a bunch of concerts that they had already done and made a virtual concert for Mother's Day where they just took recordings of the old ones and broadcast them. And so I got money for that because they, they took the recording. They're not supposed to, you know, uh, if there is a recording, we're supposed to get money for that. So now in order to avoid that kind of problem, right? Like people having to pay more money when they didn't, they will sometimes have in the contract absolutely no recording. So that kind of pe that kind of thing. Um, Mr. Walker said, asks, "What Levy Park? What time? It's at one o'clock." So, um, I thought you were like in Tennessee or something like that, <laughs> or are you in Houston? I thought you were in Tennessee, or or Alabama or someplace like that. Um, so yeah, that's great, Anthony. You know what? 
there are some things that the metronome method is not as good at, right? So like if you have something, if the thing that you're trying to do is consecutive notes of the same value, um, let's say, for example, something like the, the um, Clark Technical Studies, right? Right? If you need to get that up to a tempo, there's a sequence of rhythms that, um, there's a sequence of rhythms that you can use to get your fingers going faster without stressing your mind out, right? So the first one is you do fermata, 32nd note, fermata, 32nd note, fermata, like this. of the flowers okay is that the one okay i can't remember the melody now so uh, all right mr walker i didn't realize you were in houston channel view just outside beltway eight you know i used to go over there the fish until i found out that there was so much mercury in that water <laughs> But yes, I used to go over there to fish where where the I-10 goes over the bridge. I would go go around down to the boat um, boat dock, you know, the one by the bridge. And um, I used to eat the stuff out of there. My the last very last fish I caught there was a nice sheep's head. Um, and then um <laughs> Then I saw it on the news, right? I saw on the news that they have high mercury levels in that water. And the fish actually, you know, I went and did some fishing at, at um, what you call it, uh, Sylvan Bay. And they actually have signs up that, that say you can only eat X number of fish out of that water. It's amazing, right? Wow. And you know, there's a there's people getting uh like oysters and stuff out of that water too. So yeah, that's that was just shocking to me. But yeah, I used to go that this was like in the early nineties. I used to go there all the time to fish right there under the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the time I wish I was out there. This is flounder season right now. I wish I could go and uh, right now I don't even have a license. That's the only reason I haven't gone is I don't even have a license right now. Um, but yeah, anyway, I know that's not trumpet related. So what were we talking about? Oh, Waltz. Of the flowers, let's see. Is that the one, or is it the? I can't remember which. Let me go well, now. So yes. So anyway, I was telling you guys about that that system for for playing faster, right? So, obviously, I got it wrong. <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. All right. So, um, so I showed you the, the, um, <laughs> Mr. Walker says, I buy a license every August. So, sorry, I got you off track. Back to trumpet, right. Um, let's see here. So, I showed you. That we do Fermata 16th, uh, dotted, uh, Fermata 32nd, Fermata 32nd. Um, then you flip it. The note that was a Fermata before is a 32nd now. And 
you do this like 10 times, do the other one 10 times, and then, then you do after that. <laughs> Anthony says, the trumpet relates to all things. So the, after you do that, there's another sequence of rhythms that you can go where you do 16th, 16th, 8th, 8th. You do that 10 times. Then you do 8th, 16th, 16th, 8th. Right? You do that. Then you do 10 times. Then you do 8th, 8th, 16th, 16th. Now notice that my fingers are actually moving fast, but my mind doesn't have to move so fast, right? So you're getting that subconscious muscle memory on those notes without having to really push the metronome. It's a beautiful way of doing it. And you can also do like, like three notes. That's a little bit harder. So there are variations of this where you kind of put the two together. Yes, that is the Clark study. I was just using that as an example because if you have consecutive notes, that's the best way to speed it up, not necessarily the, the metronome method. If it's a rhythm, then we don't do that with a rhythmic thing, right? But if you have something like Clark study where it's the same rhythm note all the way through, then this is the best way to get those that tempo up, is to do these change. We, some people call it changing rhythms. Um, some people call it quick change, but it's a much, much better way to learn how to play fast than just trying to creep the metronome. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, very good. Um, okay, the notes are eight notes slurred. Okay, good. So this is something you could use, right? You could actually use this approach. And basically it's doing some notes slow, some notes fast, and moving that around to cover all the notes. The first one you should always do is the fermata, 16th, fermata, 16th. Um, and the idea is that you think about the next two notes as you're holding the fermata. So it's like you're mentally getting ready for the next two notes while you're sustaining the one note. Okay? Very good. All right, well, we are out of time. This was not my best. <laughs> my mind is like, um, and it's time for me to go get my hair cut. I've been, I found a barber. Woohoo! So um, this will be my third time going to him. Uh, and I love it because um, I've been wanting to go to a barber for a long time instead of a hairstylist, huh? And he's an ex Marine. And it's just a, a great, I get in there and he goes zip, 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 and he's done and it looks good and, uh, and, and yes, this is, I'm um, like, you're my hero. <laughs> I hate getting my hair cut. He makes it easier. You know, I just get in there and get it done. So um, that's where I'm going right now. <laughs> Anthony says, get your hair styled like Clint Eastwood. <laughs> anyway. All right, guys. God bless you guys. Um, always nice to hang out with you. We'll see you guys next week. And like I said, I might put this video out now because it should be finished. So be looking for that. It's about the lipsters. All right. Okay. All right. See you next time. Have a great week. Bye.